Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, First You Choir. It's so wonderful to to be with you today and to hear your music. And thank you to the AV team, which is also allowing those who are joining us online to be with us this day. It's great to see you. So when I was a young adult and still in college, I was recruited by the Minister of Religious Education at the local Unitarian Universalist Church to be part of a teaching team in a new program she was launching at the church school. Caroline Fenderson and I had met because she was also a guidance counselor at the elementary school where I was doing a year-long internship in developmental play therapy as part of my program, uh, my college program uh, in psychology. This religious education program was for first and second graders, and it focused on the themes of being at home in the world of nature, being at home in our own bodies, and being at home with ourselves, and being at home in the communities that we create. It had an ingenious way of introducing these primary school children to being at home as a fundamental human and religious sentiment. Through the exploration of the natural habitats of animals, we learned the various ways that animals build or find a home. Through teaching the development of a child in its first home, the womb, we learned the miracle and the wonder of the human birth process. Through actively creating a community in the classroom, an open space classroom, where each child with a large refrigerator box created their own house and decorated it the way they wanted and figured out um, who they wanted to invite in and who not into their new home. Children learned the importance of creating a special place to go to where they could reflect and nurture their own self and also how to create a neighborhood among these houses in our open space classroom. It was a fabulous experience for the children, I believe, but more, even more, it was a foundational experience for me as I learned more about this idea of being at home as a core religious idea. Without belaboring the idea right now, it was a dramatically different kind of religious education uh, experience and perspective than I had in the religious education program in my Roman Catholic upbringing. Now, don't get me wrong, I mostly valued my Catholic religious education programs, especially during the junior and senior high years uh, when there was a lot of experimentation and deliberate attempts to openness, experimentation, and focusing on social justice and engagement in the world. However, there was still this lingering undertow from these experiences in my Catholic religious education. Both explicitly and implicitly, the message that uh, tended to be uh, brought was that humans are only sojourners on this earth. That our real home that we were preparing for was heaven where we'd, we live in eternally with God if we made the cut. <laughs> in my upbringing, there was this idea that we were at war with the temptations or the pleasures of our body. And being at home in our bodies was not an explicit emphasis. Individual expression was mostly not valued as much as conformity. So during this experience of teaching first and second graders in this UU religious education program, I had an immersion to some of the distinctive underlying theological perspectives in Unitarian Universalism, which included a focus on this world and not an overemphasis on the world to come. An honoring of our humanity as innately good and the world as one of original blessing in the natural world and the human communities rather than the emphasis on human depravity and original sin. In fact, the song that we sang together in our call to worship this morning comes from that religious education program that I participated in years ago. (laughs) 
let's build a church for you and me, a place where we can be happy and free. As you recall in the singing of that, the zipper song, we invited you to intentionally think of the qualities that you wanted to invite into this community this year, this year, a joyful church, a safe church, a loving church, a playful church, a hopeful church. Since this is our in-gathering Sunday of the new church year, it's indeed a time to set our intentions for what kind of church community we want to build and cultivate and create together. Church is not an add water and stir experience, although we did gather water today. (laughs) We must be the church. The church is not something someone else is going to do for you. If we are to be a presence to one another and a healing and liberating presence in the broader community of Wilmington, it is up to us, up to us to declare and to decide what each of us is going to do to build this church, to build this community this year, right now. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Perhaps the most challenging quality... Did they do some... Yeah, okay. They're always threatening to do that. I'm glad they did. Perhaps the most... Keep you on your toes. It may come again. Perhaps the most challenging quality to actually be intentional about these days is that one that included the verse of hopeful. It's not easy to be hopeful these days. It's much easier to be despairing. While there is something inherently hopeful in our Unitarian Universalist approach to life and to religion, are we simply naive? I took the question with me as I explored this topic of hope through the perspectives of various uh, people over the last several weeks. After all, I had set my topic for this Sunday weeks ago, Hope Calls Us Home. So I sincerely sincerely hoped I could have something to say about it. (laughs) So what I first learned across all of the various perspectives I explored is that we often have some misconceptions about what hope is. Our confusion may then lead to a diminishment of our capacities to cultivate hope because these misconceptions can often lead us to to skepticism and cynicism rather than towards a pathway to embody and to act on hope. So I read the words of a psychologist, a global consultant, an activist, a Buddhist Quaker, a poet, and some Unitarian Universalist clergy. Now, I will only summarize the highlights of what I learned from them. I took on this task because I believe that we deserve to have a nuanced understanding of hope more nuanced than usual, and I also believe it is essential for us to do so at this moment, at this time in history. And I also believe that it's critical, given all the ways that we could otherwise build a case for despair, or appear foolish or Pollyannish by dedicating ourselves to hope at this time in human history, let's deepen our understanding of a hope that actually grounds us, propels us, and moves us forward in meaningful and purposeful and impactful ways. As it turns out, there are over 100 research studies on hope-filled people. Don't worry, I'm not going through every, every one of those research studies. That not only philosophers and poets, but contemporary naturalists and social scientists have studied this topic of hope with eyes wide open to all the reasons of not having hope. Yet their conclusions about hope, I believe, can provide for us some practical guidance. By that I mean there are some practices that we can engage in to cultivate hope. Since I personally often like to highlight in my sermon What does any topic actually mean for us in practice? I want to share some of those practices with you as well. The real significant perspective, however, are the ones that you draw for yourself and that we draw for ourselves as a congregation if we are to be a hopeful church 
for you and me. So what does that actually look like in practice? Well, let's start with the naturalist, Jane Goodall. Who's heard of her? Okay. She's the world's most famous living naturalist, most known for her work with chimpanzees in their natural habitat. When Goodall, when Goodall sorry, was asked why she can be hopeful, she makes her case in a way that is grounded in seeing what is really happening right now and one that is not an ideological hope, but a call to practical action. So I'll quote from her response to this question from the conversation recorded in this title, The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times by Jane Goodall and Douglas Adams. Goodall offers this perspective. I'm facing up to the facts, and on many days I admit that I feel depressed days when it seems that the efforts, the struggles, the sacrifices of so many people fighting for social and environmental justice, fighting prejudice and racism and greed are fighting a losing battle. The forces raging around us, greed, corruption, hatred, blind prejudice, just are ones we might be foolish to think we can overcome. It's understandable that there are days we feel we are doomed to sit back and watch the world end not with a bang, but a whimper. She's drawing from that line from T.S. Eliot. Then she traces her own 88 years of living and the history of those years included such things as Hitler and the Nazis, the Cold War and the threat of thermonuclear war, the torture and the death of millions across the globe in what she calls many dark periods of so much suffering in the world during her lifetime. Given our own current predicament and the challenges of her own history of observing the world, she was asked a second time by the interviewer, do you honestly believe there is hope for our world, for the future of our children and our grandchildren? And she responds in this way, I am able to answer truthfully, yes. I believe we still have a window of time during which we can start healing the harm we have inflicted upon this planet. But that window is closing. If we care about the health of the natural world, we must get together and take action. She clarifies further, what is the hope I still believe in that keeps me motivated to carry on fighting the good fight? What do I really mean by hope? And like everyone else I read, she first has to dispel some of the current misconceptions that many of us have about hope. She says, hope is often misunderstood. People tend to think that it's simply positive or wishful thinking. I hope Something will happen, but I'm not giving, going to do anything about it. This, she says, is indeed the opposite of hope, which requires action and engagement. What does it require? Many people understand the dire nature of this planet, but do nothing about it because they feel helpless and hopeless. I want to help people realize that their actions, however small they may seem, will truly make a difference. The cumulative effect of thousands of ethical actions can help to save and improve our world for future generations. Hope, she says, is contagious. Your actions will inspire others. Indeed, she puts this into action herself through her speaking around the world at universities and conferences and her work with children and youth in a global program that she started called Roots and Shoots. The main message of this program is that every single individual matters, has a role to play, and makes an impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what sort of impact we make. Her co-author, Douglas Adams, has explored some of the meta-analysis of those over a hundred studies on hope, and he refines our understanding of hope and makes some clear distinctions that I think would be helpful for us. Adams states, when we focus on the future, we do one of three things. One, we fantasize. 
which involves big dreams that are mostly for fun and entertainment. We dwell, which involves focusing on all the bad stuff that might happen. This can be actually the official pastime of many these days. Or we hope, which involves envisioning the future while recognizing the inevitability of challenges. He points out that the research on hopeful people shows that they can actually anticipate setbacks along the way and deliberately work on ways to remove the obstacles. Adam's study led him to conclude that I was learning that hope wasn't just a Pollyanna avoidance of the problems, but a way of engaging them. These same hope studies identified four components that I think are essential to any lasting sense of hope in our lives and perhaps in the world. They include these. Have realistic goals to pursue. Have as well realistic pathways to achieve them. Cultivate the confidence that we can achieve these goals and have the support to help us overcome adversity along the way. So, each of these components is important. If one is missing, we might not have traction to move forward in actually enacting and engaging our world with a sense of hope. So let's test it out a little bit. Think of a hope that you have for your own life, for our church, or for this world. I'll pause for a moment. And then when you look up with me, at me with a hopeful stare, I know that we can proceed. Do you got, have something? Okay. So let's test it out. In having this hope that you just named to yourself, do you have realistic goals to pursue? There's no grade on this, so just doing this as a self-assessment for yourself. Okay. Do you have realistic goals to enact that hope? Do you have some realistic pathways to achieve them? Do you have some confidence that you can achieve these goals through the pathways that you've outlined? Do you have some support to overcome some of the inevitable adversity you will encounter along the way. So that hope cycle involves all of those. If one of those is missing, it's probably hard for us to actually act and embody and engage the world with a hopeful stance. Does that make sense to you? Each of these questions can help you hone your hope, help us hone our hopes into actual hopes because we actually have ways to enact and in to engage them. Now, we're not alone in our hopes. I am so inspired by what I see all around in this congregation of the hopes that have been enacted and engaged. What are some of those that you could point to in our lived experience of this congregation? What are those things that we are doing that are enacting and engaging our hopes? I'm waiting to listen. What are some of those? Ilya. Ilya. Capis. Uh, explain that is for someone who might not know. Okay. What else? Solar project. The life stream offerings, pastoral care, Peace Week. So all around us, we have reminders of ways this congregation is already acting on and engaging the world with a hopeful stance. Let's keep reminding each other, particularly at those times when we may move more towards despairing than towards hoping. Can we do that? We sometimes can draw on the hopes realized by others and by collective action to cultivate our own hopes. We need to be, as Buren's and Parker said in the meditation that I read, 
a house of hope for our time. And we find people, we need to find people who embody hope for us. I know that some of us appreciate the, the writing of uh, Edith Ager, whose work as a uh, Holocaust survivor and a psychologist in her 90s points out that sometimes people confuse hope with idealism. Edgar says idealism is a defense mechanism, not unlike denial or delusion. Hope does not deny evil, but it is a response to it. Hope, in other words, is not the same as wishful thinking. It takes into account the facts and the obstacles, but it does not let them overwhelm us. So what does it mean to practice hope when we have no guarantees that everything will turn out all right? That was the very question that Margaret Wheatley addresses in one of her recent books. How do we choose to be facing reality, claiming leadership, restoring sanity? And those, actually, the subtitle are the guidance that she gives. Name reality. Claim leadership. Claim what you're going to do in response to that reality, and restore sanity. She believes that we can cultivate a sense of hope and empowerment in a time that seems to call for disempowering denial and equally disempowering despair. In a world dominated by news of record heat waves, ecological collapse, and threats to our democracy, It is what do we choose to be is the question that she confronts us with. So, some practical guidelines from the psychologist Dan Tomasolu. Set goals and most importantly, take the actions towards achieving them. This sets up an upward spiral of engagement and accomplishment. Keep a healthy balance of taking in differing perspectives, but don't get overwhelmed or, I would add, distracted or discouraged by the negativity around us. Focus on the present, on what is in front of you instead of dwelling on the past or worrying about the future. Be grateful for what you have, which may keep you grounded and appreciative in the moment. Be able to take reasonable risk to support growth by being willing to be imperfect and to fail. This requires developing a learning mindset and a reflectivity that asks us to reflect on what we learned from so-called mistakes. Don't let circumstances define your emotional response. Instead, formulate solutions and seek ways to overcome obstacles. I love the memorable image that another one of my teacher, Valerie Brown, describes in, who describes herself as a black Quaker Buddhist, offers in her most recent book, Hope Leans Forward. I think you'll appreciate this image as well. She writes, hope like happiness, as you know, isn't a constant. It, it isn't a place where we set up camp and live forever. Hope like happiness, courage, and bravery is a choice. It doesn't necessarily track what's happening in our daily life or the external world around us. It's not predictable or constant. Hope isn't like a degree you hang on the wall and admire. Instead, it's more like Play-Doh, the kid's clay-like toy that you smush and squeeze and mold into shapes. Hope is malleable. So above my desk now is a framed photo that a photographer friend of mine gave to me at my ordination centuries ago. (laughs) She and her photographer husband were on an assignment in Italy to take photos to include in an Italian language textbook. The photo is black and white. It pictures a woman dressed in black sitting outside her home on a stone sidewalk with her door ajar facing the street. My friend Carol explained to me that most women in this small town in Italy who dressed in black were widows. Then she said, this 
was the only widow we saw who did not face the wall, but faced out onto the street. I'm encouraged by that photo each day that I see it and I look up from my desk. It's a reminder to me that we can respond to our circumstances in unexpected ways and not always be determined by them. So perhaps this week you might think about what will be your icon for hope that you can hang up somewhere where you can be continually reminded, consistently reminded to act towards hope. For me, it was that photograph. It's that photograph. What will it be for you? We can strain, my friends, to see the horizon. We can see through to our aims and not lose sight of them. We don't need to let circumstances define or limit our response. We can act on and engage the world in hope. So may it be. Amen.